I'm running out of things to do, but sit here and sing songs to you. I'm singing, you're running to get away. At least you're doing something useful today. <laughs> Yeah. We're rolling here, man. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Rolling, rolling. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Rolling. Yamaha, Kawhi, Steinway. We are rolling. You are rolling. What's going on, my little marshmallow? Hey. <laughs> Why, I haven't been called that name in years. Since the last time I called you that, right? Did you call me Marshmallow last time? I don't remember that you've ever called me that. Oh, yeah, maybe years yeah. ago. I remember in our childhood, back when you were young and so was I. I called you Marshmallow a few years ago and you looked at me funny and I was like, all right, guess I won't do that again. No, no, but that means it works. <laughs> What? It's supposed to make you feel awkward. Well, yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna get a response, you gotta get a response, man. Yeah. Hi, yep. Stan. What's going on, Marshall? Well, I'm ready to do whatever we're gonna do today. We're gonna do voicemails? Uh yeah. Ooh, oh, I gotta open up my voicemail folder. You sure do. That's your responsibility, not mine. I just sit here and wait to bestow wisdom. Yeah, Marshall's got no responsibilities again. It's easy for me. It is. Although I did report on an entire book or two to you. You want credit? Yeah. <laughs> I love that job. Hey, how you been, Stan? Anything new? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's start. Let's, let's jump into the voicemails. Hello, Jasmine. This is Justin. I'm currently 17, and I'm going to college in about a year and a half. So I know you guys did a podcast over like the art schools and stuff, but first just boiled down into like, you know, what is the money or, you know, I just thought you got that. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, is it worth it to go to these colleges within California and New York because of like the density and also obviously there's going to be a lot more people and opportunities? Um, or would it be more worth to go to, you know, um, other places like Rhode Island, uh, Maryland, and also Philadelphia, or just cut all that out, and um, would it be more worth to go take classes from professionals? I recently only started drawing <laughs> about six that? months ago, and I absolutely love her art. So I'm wondering, where could you take these classes other than online? Um, but like in person, uh, you know, Marshall talked about how he did teach these classes, but, you know, I'm not sure where exactly. Oh, and I also have another question about where did you guys go for the Asking the Pro series? I have no idea about events because I've never been outside my state. So, um, I would be grateful um, if you had to answer any of these questions. So, thank you guys so much. I didn't get the thing that you laughed at. <laughs> so, the first question was like, should he go to these colleges, what states? And then he said, or should I go study from professionals? <laughs> so, he's saying the people that teach at colleges are not professionals, which could be kind of accurate, right? I mean, kind uh, of, but sometimes. yeah, not it always. Depends. Yeah, yeah. It depends, it depends on what on college. college yeah. It depends so much on the college. And, and it depends on the teacher in the college. It does. It's, <laughs> But it's just funny how that was phrased. It, it did. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was hilarious. I don't know. Also, the simplification of the of the categories is that you've got professionals teaching in college and you've got non-professionals teaching in college. You've got professionals teaching in college who are lousy teachers and you've got non-professionals teaching in college who are good teachers and you've got non-professionals who are teaching out of college who are not good teachers and the ones that are good teachers and the professionals. You got wow, every combination. you did that without so, stumbling. That was amazing. Yeah, the, the thing is, you go to recommendations. Yeah. You go to recommendations, Justin. You listen to people who are excited about what they're getting in a class and the people who warn you away from what they're getting in a class. You can't just say that this category is the thing or, or the other. But we've, we have answered those questions before. What was another question in there? Uh, before we go on to the other questions, I, I have a comment though on the, the different cities. Um, I had a one hour private like Zoom like mentoring session with a, with a, a Proco Challenge winner 
a few weeks ago. Thought he? But he, he's awesome. He did like, he was in the self-portrait challenge last year and he did this amazing self-portrait, very realistic, just really good oil painting. Um, mm -hmm. And he's super young. He's still in, in high school. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this, I, I seriously thought this was a professional artist, like in his 50s or something. Uh, but he's, he, this kid is super smart, very talented. Like he learns anything really fast. He's the type of guy that just like picks everything up after, like he learned English. <laughs> this is what he told me. He learned English by watching Proco videos and watching Caesar Santos uh -huh. and watching some other videos on YouTube. <laughs> I'm like, so right, what? right there, he's revealing <laughs> that I'm a self learner. Yeah. He, I, my motivation is, well, give me whatever you can give me and I'll learn from it. Yeah. But he, so he lives, I forgot, shoot, I forgot what country he lives in. Sorry. Um, but it's, 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 it's in Europe and it, it's a very poor country. Um, there's not much as far as art education there and he wants to get, he wants to get out. He knows that he needs to go somewhere else if he's going to make a career. And basically the, 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 the reason I'm even telling this is I gave the advice I gave him was that he does not need a school. Okay. He's looking to go to college. He, he does not need it to learn the skills. He's already got the skills. He freaking won a Proco challenge because his stuff was so freaking good that it beat other professionals that were competing. And like, why would he need to go to these colleges to learn from people that aren't as good as him? Um, but I still told him, go to New York. If you can, if you can go to New York, find any school, that you could get into that'll give you, you know, allow you to travel to the United States just so you can get out and start experiencing, make, you know, con uh, connecting with other artists, um, growing your network, just being around people that are also in love with doing what you do. So that is a real big benefit, I think, of going to a dense city like um, Josh, Jacob. What's his name? This was Justin. Was Justin. it Justin? I, I guess. Sorry, it was, I knew it was a J. Um, that he he brought up that it's a you know should I go to a dense city? And I think there there is really some value there in going to a dense city, not to learn information, but in connecting with other people. I mean, the density that that is the the the, the advantage there is that you're you have so many more opportunities to grow your network and find like minded people that you could you know, create lifelong bonds with and you'll forever, you know, be around these people. Um, so, yeah, my, my advice is yes. <laughs> yeah. Go, go to these, but don't expect to learn from these colleges. You might, absolutely, you absolutely right. might, but don't depend on it. Follow our advice from the, uh, the Recreating Your Own Art School series. Make sure you are still very responsible for your own education but use these for community. Go yeah. to New York to, for the community and, and that's very beneficial. I agree. I don't know that we have anything more to say than what we said in those eight episodes. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and do you know the difference between the perceived and the real need that therapists talk about? Like something that you think you need and then something yeah. you, you actually need? Right. When a person comes in and says, the problem is with the person I live with. Right. And the therapist okay. says, yeah, let's hear about it. <laughs> and the, the real problem is with you. If you yeah, can get yeah. past every, the perceived need always is I got to go to the big city and go to an art school and, and do all of those other things. What's the real need? What is it you want? And if you've mm -hmm. got such great technical skill that you're going to be a better artist than me as your teacher, then you've got to decide, do I really need him as a teacher? Do I need to pay someone else money? And the answer may or may not be yes, but get past the perceived need. Mm -hmm. And you can do that by putting it on paper and thinking about it, yeah. talking about it with others. What is the real need? What Stan just addressed is that the need of community is usually greater than people think when they're they're getting their getting their art school uh, skills is certainly priority, 
But if you got your art skills and you're not around people who make you sharper and make connections, then that's something that's missing. So if you can find a way to do that, yeah. But like we said in that series, the information is probably the easiest thing you can get outside of art school. So it is. If you don't get that from your college, no big deal. <laughs> get it on your own. Gosh, we've answered this question so many times in the well, last two years. That just means it's really important. A lot of people have it. So it is. It's right. fine. He asked about the Asking Pros series that I filmed. That was at Comic Con. That it, that's San Diego Comic Con yeah. is where I, I'm. I'm in San Diego, so. It's easy for me to go to that mm -hmm. and I just walk around uh, the artist alley and just walk up to people, literally just randomly, I'll just walk up to a booth. <laughs> I'm like, hey, do you have 10 minutes? Can I ask you some questions? And then I just like whip out my camera and start filming them. It used to be before the internet and even all, all the way through years after the internet that Comic Con was here where careers got launched. And so trade shows, as we mentioned before, are a great way that if once a year you can make a pilgrimage to the trade show where that's uh, the people who would hire you and those are the people you will create relationships, that can help if you can't move to a place, you can at least yeah, visit a place. Yeah, but it does not replace it though. It can I know, help. it doesn't replace it can help, but it, that is not, that's not even close to being the same thing as being within a community all the time, every day. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. But yeah. you don't need to be in a big city to have a community though. I mean, San Diego, I get San Diego is a big, big, pretty big city. So that, I guess that's, but it's not like New York. I'm not, I'm not right. in New York. I'm not in LA. Yeah. Like when I was in high school, I seriously thought I was going to have to move to LA in order to be an artist. Mm -hmm. I was telling my girlfriend at the time, Melissa, like, man, we're, I'm going to have to move. You want to, are you going to come with me? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I ended up, of course, not, not, but um, I seriously thought that was the only way that mm -hmm. I would be able to get my career going as an artist, but San Diego is big enough for me to get that community. I mean, I went to Watts Atelier and that was more than enough for me to get, make friendships and, and, and have a support network and um, all that. So don't feel like, you know, LA and New York are the only cities dense enough to have a good community. And go back and listen to that podcast again that we did on community. Community was only one of the eight topics we dealt with, but yeah. we did devote oh, yeah. one podcast to it, as I recall. We did, yeah. Next question. Hey, how's it going? My name is Lindsay, and I'm curious about your guys' thoughts about habits. I was recently listening to James Clear, and he was talking about the British bicycle racing team who were really terrible and never won the Tour de France. <laughs> and they got a new coach who implemented the marginal gains approach, where he had them change their uniforms and change their um, training habits and just a bunch of small things that didn't seem like they would make much difference and in fact were only designed to improve their performance one percent but cumulatively and over time they ended up winning the tour de france a bunch of times and uh, the olympics so i was curious if there were habits that you guys thought would have a similar effect on improving your drawing skills just small things maybe like the way that you prepare your pencil or how you have your your artist station set up or what time of day you work or warm-up exercises any little small changes that might only make a tiny difference but if you work on practicing a whole lot of them and you work on practicing them every day would actually improve your skills better than if you had not. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Thank you. That makes so much sense. I don't even feel like I need to answer the question. I'm very interested. In <laughs> Charlie can <laughs> Charlie can put that uh, the whoever that book is or whoever that person is who became the coach uh, so that everyone knows about it. That was an <laughs> interesting yeah. question that all I could say is yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, well, her question is, do we specifically have any minor micro habits that lead add up to macro results? You want to go ahead? Go ahead. Just tell us. I, mean, I feel like the, I, the bigger ones are more, more important to identify first, right? Or you could go from the most trivial to the most important. <laughs> okay, well, I'd have to spend some time to rearrange them in my, on paper or something. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not prepared to answer it that methodically either. Hold on, Charlie. Let's let's pause for like a few minutes and just. Or think. you want me to go? No, let's just think for a few okay. minutes. I'm okay. Just, just, I need to just like quietly ponder.
what you're observing is a man in thought. This is something <laughs> Are you watching me alone. instead of thinking on your own? I, I, I was thinking on my own That's and then creepy. I looked up at my screen and I could see that you were thinking and I figured, well, <laughs> if I could just, just pick up your vibe. Now I'm just going to be thinking about how you're looking and watching me think. <laughs> That's so <yeah>. distracting. <laughs> no, a lot of the ones I thought about are things that are like, make you more organized and clear your mind, right? Um, like having, having a way to quickly get things out of your head. Um, if you have an idea, you, you write it down somewhere, some organized fashion, like little buckets that you could throw stuff in. Just because mm -hmm. it, being creative means you, you're, you're using your head all the time, right? Mm -hmm. You, 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 you got to make sure that your mind is working properly and you don't have... Um, a bunch of stuff distracting you constantly that you're thinking about. Yeah. Also, things like just routine, little routine things, uh, setting up your materials. Like, I know that with Watts Atelier, one habit that Jeff Watts made sure that everybody got into all the time was just at the beginning of class, you go sharpen your pencil. Spend 10 minutes just like making sure your pencil was really nicely sharpened. Wow. Um, and not just once, sharpen three of them because one of them might break. Right. And if it breaks while the model is up there, you don't want to waste half of that session resharpening your pencil. You want to have three ready to go. Um, but just that routine of just like carefully getting that nice point, it, 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 it you begin your whole session with just like putting love into the craft. It's not just about like sticking a pencil into a sharpener and you're ready. It's like you're, you're preparing your blade for your fight, you know? Yeah, it's, that's um, great, Stan. That is, that is just wonderful. Yeah, just what you well, said I didn't think about is, it. That's Jeff Watts. <laughs> or maybe yeah, someone else that taught Jeff Watts. But just what you said, I usually, even last night in class, I told people, get prepared. We're going to do something akin to guided meditation for your ideas. So get your pencils or your pen or your paper prepared. Mm -hmm. And I give them a minute and I'm thinking now, gosh, that should be a, that could be a three, four, five minute checklist of are you ready so that there's more wind up. Yeah, more wind up because during those moments where you're sharpening the pencil, you're kind of bored. It's boring and that's good. Boredom is great for creativity because your mind naturally starts to think of something, trying to, tries to think of something interesting, right? So, you start, yeah. you start getting into the groove of like of being creative with with whatever you're about to do yeah at least for me it's just it always it made me always start thinking about drawing and what i'm gonna just start imagining what my drawing is gonna look like what i'm gonna be doing there in that class that's great create deliberate boredom just before <laughs> it's like waiting for the curtain to go up and it's it's <laughs> yeah they're, they're, okay. yeah that's that's wonderful that's a great yeah. thing thank you for that what about you? Do any little habits other than eating yogurt? I don't eat yogurt before I'm going to do something important. Oh, does it make your stomach grow? I don't eat. I often don't eat. Yeah, just make oh, it. Oh, there's point. there's one. Yeah. Don't yeah. eat. <laughs> but but there's there's the big ones and there's, I divide it into the big ones and the universal ones, uh, big ones or universal ones and the small ones. And the big ones are if there's anything important, sleep is a big deal. And uh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's huge. Walking, exercise previous to something important to diffuse excess tension is a big deal. And just uh, the the obvious things. If the food that you eat makes you feel bad afterward, as quickly as possible, get out of the habit of that food and put other food around. Those kind of things. The people that you're around afterward, you feel drained or exhausted. Uh, change the relationships and get into other relationships, all those big things. But the small things for me, maybe it isn't such a small thing. I don't drink coffee that often anymore, but I reserve coffee only for if I'm doing something that I really want my energy to be up. So, it's a luxury. That's a small one. And just personal ritual, like what Stan just mentioned, the ritual of getting ready. With this podcast, it's camera, 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 audio, 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 uh, <laughs> notes, uh, making sure everything's plugged in right. That that is is always been a hassle to me. But now I feel like it is part of the getting ready for this. So, any any ritual, the whole thing I'm getting out of this from what you said is, I wrote it down for myself, emphasize ritual of preparation, mm -hmm. create deliberate boredom as a preliminary to 
going. Yeah. Well, it's probably up to you to make up your own and observe how your peers do them. We, we've mentioned a lot of big ones like diet, exercise, sleep, <laughs> water. <laughs> but she's asking about the micro ones. Those are hard to identify because the fact that they're habits means we're not thinking about them anymore. Well, there's one that I'm not in the habit, one I'm not in the habit of that I wish I was in. When I sit down to work, the, the times that I sit down to work, I have different spaces and the position of my body is important. Okay. So, that there's lumbar support or I'm going to be outside next to plants or whatever thing uh, is important for that time of day and where the sun is. Yeah. But I don't have the habit yet of working while standing up mm. and I want to get into that habit. It seems like the people I've watched, I have a sister-in-law who works standing up and she's done it for years and she's just in such great shape and physical energy and there's something about the way she works that I feel like a lot of it is related to, to standing. You should go all in and just get a treadmill desk. <laughs> I want- Maybe. Okay, Marshall, next week yeah. when we record, you better be on a treadmill the whole time. <laughs> Maybe we can work that out. <laughs> treadmill recording studio. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so awesome. You just the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm willing to try it if you'll if you'll buy the treadmill for me. Hey, here's what we can do. If, wait, if I buy you a treadmill, I would do a podcast. No, no, it can't be a treadmill. It can't, it can't be a treadmill. It could be a dry heat sauna. Wait, oh wait, wait, wait. Why did you just change it? Because I'd rather I have a dry serious. heat sauna than a treadmill. You're gonna record in a dry heat sauna? Yeah, we should try that. I think we should try it. If we don't like it, and I get to keep the dry heat sauna, are you gonna put it in your room? No, I put it. I put it in the side of the house. What? How are you going to put your recording studio in there? We'll, we'll work that out. Okay. We don't want to say, you're, hey, we shouldn't do this because it's going to be too hard. We say we're going to do it and then we your go- Your camera is going to overheat. <laughs> no, no. You put the camera right outside of the dry heat sauna, outside of the glass. It'll work. I've uh, done stuff like this before. Uh, okay. All okay. Right. Now, Bad idea. let's, in the comments, <laughs> give some thought before you put them in there. <laughs> As to what little rituals yeah. really you feel have helped you. That's actually a perfect comment question. You, you it is. Such a good, okay, yeah. Keep them short and that way you get a whole bunch of them, you make a list and then we are crowd seeding everybody's wisdom. But asking the crowd is such a, such a better approach to this than asking two people. Except when it isn't because sometimes you ask a crowd and you get a thousand different things that just muddy the waters. But when you get good ones, if you're willing to trudge through the mud, hey, we can we can upvote them. People can upvote which That's ones are the most useful. That's what naturally happens. I guess it does. I'm that out of touch. Sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. Next question. Next question. Hello, Finn and Marshall. My name is Chris. A uh, huge fan of the podcast. A uh, um, huge fan of the website um, on the beta. My question revolves around getting a career in the art field, specifically entertainment. So a little background on me, I am the typical art graduate that put the pencil down for years and got a nine to five at a bank. Um, recently, I picked up the pencil once again and I realized two things. One, I don't want to be that guy from Art and Fear who He's sitting at a cafe in his senior years and laments about how he used to do art. I want to do this as a career specifically in entertainment, like I just mentioned. Um, my question is, with all these online resources, all these online programs and classes, how does one uh, go through all of that stuff and find what is the correct program for them, specifically in the entertainment industry? The following question is... Uh, what steps can one take to get there as well? Um, if all of this seems very abstract, uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, a big fan. Okay, so we could start recommending resources, but that's not as useful as telling them how to do this themselves because we could recommend some resources today, but in two years, there could be much better ones, right? There's, there's always different new teachers teaching this different or the, the same thing, essentially. Like the, for the entertainment industry, as the entertainment industry evolves, new teachers will teach those and there'll be different workshops available and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. With anything, entertainment or comics or animation or fine art, any whatever field you're trying to get into and you're trying to figure out how do I filter through all the available resources on the internet, go to a community, go to Reddit, find a subreddit that 
is related to what you're trying to get into and ask in there. What are the best resources? A bunch of people will respond and you'll see the overlap and you start going down those paths. Some of them might you might not like, some of them you will. But as you dive deeper and deeper into this field, you'll slowly start to hear more. Um, you start to follow big teachers in your field on Twitter and on Instagram, on YouTube. And you just start hearing from them about other resources and you just keep trusting your gut about what you think is high quality and what isn't. Um, but yeah, you could start by just go to Reddit, go, go to another forum or a, a community that, that is related to your field. Whatever it is, just find it and ask. <laughs> Don't ask us at the moment. You know what? Go to Proco.com. Because <laughs> Pro, yeah. Proco, Proco 2.0 will be out by now. Chris, this is homework for you. Okay, when this episode comes out, Proco 2.0 is, will already be launched. I want you to go to the community section on Proco and ask in the community, what are the best resources, what are the best classes for me to start taking now to, be, to become a professional in the entertainment industry? Great. Yeah. Stan's been working on this for years. He's yeah. created an a arena. He's got a building for you to come into and have community. Yeah. Put it to and use. And then anybody who's listening now that has a good answer, go find Chris's <laughs> question and answer them. <laughs> now we're using this podcast for social good. <laughs> Let's just do this for every question. Like, yeah. you know what? Why don't you just go to the Proco community and ask? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there comes a point where it just may as well retire us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Hi, Stan. Uh, it's Brandon. And my question is, how do you determine the saturation of a color when shading it to make the light feel more accurate? <laughs> come on. That's a pretty technical oh, question. Come on. And very what specific. What does that even mean? Do you understand? I'm not that? sure. To I make, don't understand. How do you determine the saturation of a color when shading it to make it more accurate? That's that's a question that what? cannot be understood. I, no, I, I, it, it, I, I don't know that we should answer that. It's basically how do you put down an accurate color? <laughs> well, you yeah. tune your eye to see color naturally. There's no method. There's no answer to this other than practice to tune your eye so you can see color and then you understand how to then mix that color. There's two aspects to it. There's seeing it and understanding it and then there's executing it. So, you have to practice both of those things because sometimes you might see a color and you, and you actually don't see it correctly. It, 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 it's kind of crazy that you actually have to learn how to see bef as you're becoming an artist. But then as you start slowly start to see subtle tiny differences between colors and values in the in the real world, then you have to just understand pigment and when you mix colors together what's going to happen and how to actually mix the exact color you're looking at um, or imagining or whatever. Uh, but it's yeah, the way to do that accurately is to practice it. I really don't, I'm sorry, I hate when I just say practice but there really is no other way. It's something to be specific about when you're showing it to a teacher in a class where you're working yeah. on color and you're responding to an assignment and yeah. the teacher is taking time to show you what you did on, exactly. in that example. Yeah. Yeah. That's a question when there's somebody looking over your shoulder, you're looking at an apple and you, you ask the teacher, is this red the correct red? <laughs> Yeah, what, how could you have answered it well? That's one of the ways to test your questions. If Stan were to say 44% more magenta than you're using, but be careful about the cyan in there and make sure, I mean, what's he going to give you? Yeah, understanding principles, how does light work, tune your eye, understand color theory, understand pigment. There you go. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's move on. Hey guys, I've been struggling with jumping from resource to resource ever since I started as a beginner not too long ago. Being self-taught, it's hard to stay on a resource too long without worrying and wondering about, is this resource what I need right now? Is this resource even credible? You know, like it's not like a school environment where I know this is where I need to go. This is what I need to do. This is the source of feedback I need to get. 
right? And I watched your theories on being self-taught, and you know, I it was it had a lot of information, but I I don't know, I I still never overcame this resource anxiety where I I pick a book and I I learn from it for a while. But then my uh, improvement starts to stagnate, and I don't know whether or not because it's not a good resource, or because I'm I haven't put enough time into it, and I've I've been stuck in this endless cycle of picking up new books and dropping them, and picking up new books and dropping them, and you know my wallet can't take it anymore, and uh, I don't think my uh, my patience can take it anymore. So I just wanted to know what advice you had. For dealing with that. I don't know the exact problem he's having, but I suspect that he's missing some of the elements we've discussed in the recreating art school. He might be missing feedback or he might be missing community. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're, if you're going through resources, if you're watching videos or going through books and you do stuff and then you don't get any feedback on that stuff, it's really difficult to keep going forward. Sometimes. Some people, I don't know, somehow they're... Yeah, they it depends manage, on the personality. Yes, yeah, some of them manage to give themselves feedback. But some people really do just, they need someone to, to, to tell them what they did wrong and, and keep them going somehow. But um, I feel like this was another one where go, go, go listen to our <laughs> Recreating Art School series and see which elements you're missing here because it's like you said, it's probably not the information. You you got too many resources. You're not, um, but you need some other stuff. Yeah, I don't know that I've had this problem. I certainly haven't had it in the last 20 or 30 years. I think I had it in my 20s a bit that I would be recommended a book, like Rudolf Arnheim's book, or there was a book that I got called Comedy, Meaning and Form. It was a big, thick book that I learned nothing from, but I felt obligated to go through it. Mm. But I... I I learned eventually that if you're not getting it and it's not speaking to you and you're not feeling like there's some joy in the relationship with this book or this resource, but you didn't mention which resources or books and some might not be worth it or some might be beyond what you need right now. So that's, I mean, if, you, if you've got a really good resource, I don't know how you're going to get bored with some of the ones we've been so excited about and recommended so highly. But there is that problem of too much. Like, I have this issue too. I, I get, I come across so many resources and most of them are, are actually good and will be worth my time. Yes. And I'll get excited about one of them and I'll start. But I got so much going on that I, that I don't actually finish it and I never actually come back to it again. I know. And, and that's a problem because it's, it would have been better for me to not start five things and not finish them, but just start one and finish it. But it's hard to know. It's hard. It's hard to know when that's that's going to happen. Uh, yeah. Now that you mention it, I do have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> because I've got stacks of books, stacks of Blu-rays, stacks of DVDs, stacks of notes, and my library checkout list is so huge. <laughs> oh, I got to renew those. Yeah. And it's it, the the the. The environment, I would not say the environment becomes a disaster, but the d environment becomes stacks of things and that does bother me and I think, well, it's because I don't have enough time. If I had no job at all and no obligations at all, it would still happen out of too many interests. But uh, gosh, so I guess I don't know what the solution is to it, <laughs> except that the things that get attention are the things that get dead have deadlines. Yeah. Well, that's a big one though, because that's not always the things that should get attention. Let me give an example then from my life in the last few months. Uh, decided to do a report for Stan about hit makers for this podcast. That means we've got a deadline. And that means that all the other books get set aside. Any temptation to another book or any other research, set it aside. Live in this book for a week. And that way, I really get to know that book and I report it to Stan. So I value, he values, you value, everybody values. Same thing happened with writing The Natural Way, except that was more of a uh, two and a half month one. So if you've got a resource that you've got a friend who doesn't know that resource and say, look, I'll do this resource and then I'll get together and make a report. If you get good at making reports, that can have some 
some economic value, a lot of social value of yeah. making things easy by telling people, here are the lessons I got from this book and then show them some of the pages of it. That could be a wonderful way to do it is put yourself to some test, some accountability to say, when I'm done with this resource is that I've extracted yeah. all of the best out of it and boiled it down for my beloved peers. That's a great way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Social accountability. I mean, that, that's there, there's like websites out there that <laughs> kind of go on this this theory that if you announce something publicly, you're way more likely to follow through with it. Um, so that's great. But <laughs> I don't, I feel like another part of his question though was that he might start something and then he doesn't get results, right? He's not and, seeing it make his craft better. Yeah. If it's not making your craft better and it's not interesting to you and it's not something you're excited about, then yeah, move on to another. But how could, how could that be the case? With some of the things we've recommended. I just don't understand how that could be the case. <laughs> it, 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 it could because not everybody's like you, Marshall. Some, know, some people know. study differently. Some people need, really need the community. Some people really need uh, feedback and someone like a teacher, a mentor to hold their hand through the process until they could do it themselves. Yeah. So, you just got to try to identify that on your own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Without, but... <sighs> Rate your resources. Which ones on a scale of one to 10, which ones were the resources that were the uh, easiest to give up and which resources were the ones that were, were you stayed with the longest? And then that might give you some insight as to what it is that you're hungry for and what they're, mm. what they're feeding or not feeding. Hello, Stan and Marcel. Uh, this is Ariadne talking to you from Athens, Greece. I am a big fan of your podcast and I want to ask you a question about something that has been bothering me a lot lately, uh, specifically not safe for work art. I am a female illustrator and I love mixing horror and erotica. However, I am worried about being stigmatized by potential employers, clients or other artists. Um, and I want to ask, in your opinion, how open is the industry to more taboo subjects? Um, are there any ways for someone to do more, quote, edgy art and at the same time work on more mainstream projects? Uh, what are the pitfalls you see? Thank you both very much for your time and wish you the best. We, we've already answered this question in, I think it was season one. Yeah. It was another voicemail question. And I think to summarize, we, we, one thing we recommended was have a, an alias that two you separate do. Two separate identities. Two yeah, identities. That way that you, yeah. um, for your erotic stuff, you're, you, I mean, it's so much easier to do that now if you're, if you're online as your mm -hmm. erotic art identity. Nobody needs to know who you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could post that stuff under whatever name you want. And then professionally, the more the more serious stuff you use your real name and that's where you'll actually maybe have meetings with people and and, and they'll see your face and they'll know who you actually are was there any one yes, there was, but there was another alternative and that What's is that? just uh, don't care don't care <laughs> yeah. yeah just you know if i'm that's gonna right. lose clients good those are the clients i wanted to lose or be so so in demand that people will overlook it like they do with kim jung gi exactly yeah yeah just you're you're so good that they will submit to what you offer or they'll just go away, but there's, you're not going to lose anything from it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the world is slowly becoming more and more open to things. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly there, there's probably still companies that would never hire an artist who is known to do erotic stuff because they have to be more safe, right? Like, you know, you're, you're not going to be hired by Disney doing something for them if they know that you also are known for the erotic stuff. They just don't want that kind of bad attention, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. um, but you know, there, there, there's so many clients that you will, will have that because they don't care or, or they, they like that kind of edginess. Mm -hmm. um, so, you got to decide, are you going to lean into it or do you want to just separate the two worlds? Yeah. And, and we, we elaborated on that. We spent some yeah. time on that. So, if Charlie can let you know which episode that was. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. Hey, Stan and Marshall. I got a quick question for you. I studied architecture for my master's degree, but I've always been interested in drawing more stylized, realistic human figures. I had a professor once who actively discouraged me and always pointed me toward hyper-abstract modern work. 
The experience wasn't with a bad taste in my mouth, and I always hear criticisms so whenever I drop my fingers now. My question to you guys is, what can someone do to replace negative influences with constructive influences when it comes to art mentors? Thanks. A. Avoid the negative influences first, if you can. You already got them. What do you do yeah, now? He, okay. He's talking about replacing. He already's got them. B. Acknowledge it was a bad influence. <laughs> he's already done that. <laughs> C. Seek out people who counter that and be aware that you could go the other extreme. That's one of the things is that I don't like the way my parents did it, and so I'm going to make sure I don't do it. And then they go the other extreme and make an opposite problem and and, yeah. and foster children who will go back to the way their parents were. <laughs> Just bouncing back and forth. Yeah, reactions can make it so that we we simply fall over on the other side. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry about what happened. Yeah. Because I've heard this so many times. But it's part of what we hope that this podcast does good for people who have yet to submit to influences that do them badly. They can sniff out the red flags early on and say, I don't want to have this teacher as my influence and go to someone who's better. Identifying that you do not agree any longer with that advice is the biggest step because now you can make conscious decisions to go against that, mm -hmm. um, which might be difficult because you might still be making subconscious decisions um, and you might be constantly feeling like your decisions are just wrong and eventually give in to going back to that voice in your head. Mm -hmm. But that's the, that's the biggest step, I feel like, is yeah. you know it's wrong, you could then deliberately go the other direction, towards the other direction, not the yeah. extreme like Marshall just mentioned. Okay, let's move on. Hi, Stan and Marshall. My name's Ben, and I have a question about um, speed in the process of making art. So uh, I wrote my question down so I wouldn't ramble, so I hope this is all very clear to you. Um, okay. Uh, I was recently rewatching a clip from Draftsman called The Creative Process and How to Do It Better. I thought Marshall's example was great, going from idea to thumbnail to study and then up the ladder from there, and I found my best work has often been the result of this kind of methodical extended effort. However, I find it difficult to commit to this process sometimes, even though I have plenty of evidence that I should trust it. Because I have a full-time, non-art-related job, among other responsibilities, I have less time and energy to devote to art than I'd like. It may take me months to complete a head and shoulders pencil portrait or weeks to get out of the thumbnail stage, following the, uh, a process like the one Marshall described always gives me a better result, but I get frustrated that my practice and production of polished pieces can be spread so thin. I understand that I have a responsibility to rearrange my time to accommodate the art, and that is something I'm working on. My question is really this. How can I get more comfortable with working slow? I don't think I will ever be a particularly fast artist, so I feel the next best step for me is to change my perspective on speed and time scale. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how or if you experience confidence in slowing down. Thanks. Just He wants advice on how to be more comfortable working slower. Which means in stages. Yeah, which means not finishing as many pieces, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is all about patience, right? Well, no, it's not all about it's patience. Not? What else no, is there? No, because it also has to do with medium and choice of how you work. I have an experience from life as that I wanted to do children's books. And I got opportunities to do children's books. But the amount of money that children's books paid with the style that I had to work in, which was develop graphite drawings that would then be turned into when Photoshop came in, turn them into color drawings, uh, it was just too laborious to make it profitable. So my, I, I shared the responsibilities with uh, another colleague, but then I realized if I'm going to do children's books, I've either got to do them and not care about money or I've got to find another medium which is why I decided I wanted to learn how to watercolor because watercolor, as I knew, worked faster. So there's one thing you're doing. If you're doing portraits that are meticulous and they, they're, they're going to just take time if you're going to do that. But you might say, well, I've got my slow motion stuff and I've got the stuff that I can do pretty quickly. My, my pen and ink stuff, my spontaneous stuff, my, my uh, wet media that you can cover a lot of ground quickly. Uh, that's one thing to look at is that you may be so locked into a way of working and a style of working and a development of rendering that that's what you live with. Yeah. Your limited time might push you into a different style just because you can't, you don't have enough time to be a realistic 
portrait painter. Yeah. So now you have to be a more abstract artist or a more expressionistic artist because that's all you have time for. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I, I suspect that he wants to spend more time on painting. That's why he's asking about it. Well, then in that case, it's a matter of, of assimilating into this process and also maybe even overlapping the process. So you've got a thumbnail stage for one while you're doing a finish of another. And that way you've got the slow motion meditative work and the faster motion brainstorming work. But this is a difficult thing to interlace a schedule so that yeah. it you, you're not bored at any point. Maxfield Parrish is known for having worked that way because he worked in a lot of glazes and they took a long time to dry, but he was always active, but he was on different paintings at different times of the day and then let that one dry for a few days while I do the other thing. So there may be a way to solve this by looking at your specific process. As far as general principles, I can only think of two general principles. One is just love the work so much that you say, I don't mind that it's slow or find the work that is faster and decide I belong in this territory rather than the other territory. It fits my personality more. I think that right now he probably has some kind of incentive to finish paintings. Mm -hmm. Right, Something in his life is making him prioritize getting it done versus making it good. Mm -hmm. If he's just doing paintings for himself, he probably just wants to get as many done as possible and then nobody sees them, nobody judges him on the quality. But if these were professional, someone's paying him to do these but they don't have a deadline, he would probably put more time and effort into making sure they were good. He would not skip the thumbnail stage, right? Like there, there's more pressure on the quality versus quantity. So, I, my advice to you is to analyze your incentives. Figure out what's pushing you to do more versus more, more quality um, and change those things in your life. Change your incentives. Make sure that you're posting these online somewhere that people see. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have a following where anybody's going to see this, I mean, you got friends and family. Maybe make sure that at the end of every painting you do, you send out a newsletter to your, all your friends and all your family and be like, guys, I finished this. I'm very proud of it. If you have that as a goal or you know you're going to do this, you're going to make sure that it's good. You're not, you don't want to send your friends and family something you're not proud of. So, it's, that's going to be motivation to make it really good. I know that's what my motivation was. When I was a kid and I set projects for myself, my motivation was... I'm going to I'm going to reveal this to my family yeah. by Christmas time. I remember there were several Christmases in a row <laughs> where I was like, "Oh man, I got 3 months till Christmas. I'm going to do something awesome." And I'm going to show it to them on Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And that was that was huge motivation for me to work on this at nighttime and nobody's looking and I'm like, "Ooh, we got this thing going on." And then I reveal it and they're like, "Whoa, you made a video game?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, I did. And it's awesome." Your mind is on your audience that way. Right. And I know that some people make the argument not to think about the audience, just think about what you want. But there is a good argument to be made that you think about your audience when you're preparing something. Because you think how much that has been the motivation ever since the beginnings of art is to impress this person, to, to make this person laugh, to uh, give them some emotional experience. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful answer. Cool. But he didn't say whether he's doing this under pressure for money though, did he? I don't think, I, he didn't say, but I don't feel like he is. I okay. didn't get the sense that he is. Okay. Well, if, if you're not doing this for money and it's on your own deadline, I do have a story about that from almost 30 years ago, that when I was doing a series of illustrations that were in graphite that took 80 to 100 hours to finish, uh, one of the early ones, I got a thumbnail and then that thumbnail immediately went to the developed work and the research and it all happened in a sweep to the finished illustration. And I expected that to be, oh gosh, I'm rolling right now. There was the one that came, I think, one or two after that, that I did, I think it was between 30 and 40 thumbnails. I saved some of them trying to find it. And I, I was starting to get, think I was getting happy with it, but my studio mate kept saying, hmm, no, 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 it's just, no, nah, no. And it <laughs> bugged me to death that he did. But he was right. 
And if I had not continued to put out thumbnail after thumbnail and delay the process of the dessert of going at the finished piece with that graphite pencil and enjoying the texture and the rendering, yeah. if I had not delayed that, it would not have been as good a piece as it turned out because I would have jumped in and committed to something that wasn't as good to commit to. So yes, there is there can be the frustration with wanting to get the piece done. And if you can learn to love the exploring process, that is something that I have learned to do, to learn to love the exploring process and not feel like I got to get this out of the way, but to really feel like you're digging in the backyard and, hey, here's another stone and, hey, here's another thing and, and all this. I do want to say that there is actually the opposite problem too. Yes. Th this is a spectrum. And when you're one on one extreme, that's just bad. Like a lot of people actually... I think in our questions and also just students I've met, they have the opposite problem where they're too much into the exploration process and they never finish yeah. their stuff. That's yeah. the other extreme and you can't be on either side. You have to be balanced. <laughs> so, yeah. Future Marshall here. This next segment was meant to be seen before the How to Price Artwork episode. My fault. Sorry. Anyway, here's the origin story of that historic sale. And if you haven't seen it, you can watch the pricing episode to see where it goes. <laughs> here we go. I'm on the other extreme right now. In fact, Stan, I think I have these right here. I didn't intend to show these. They were for another reason. I don't have any time to render anymore. When I do it, when I sit down and actually take time to render and put stuff, I feel so good. I, oh, gosh, I wish I was doing this for a living. But now it is all things that take a oh, minute Can you or show it to my camera, too? I didn't see. Yeah, can you show, see it? Show it's about no yeah. bottom low. Yeah, yeah there like you go. that one. Yeah. And these are from photographs. They, they're just they're they're pieces. Ooh, that's a nice one, Mark. Wait, let me see. Let me see that yeah, one again. But, can I can I buy that one and make it into an NFT? Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Uh, here's one I think oh, it was also whoa. from a photograph. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy enough with these. And the thing is, they don't I take much one. time. Um, but they are they are one that of one's like got a thick butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that that's one. what horses look like. Well, that um, one's got a really thick butt. <laughs> this this is an example that's of cool. I get no finished pieces out of these. I well. only get the the practice and the playing with the pin enough to say I enjoy playing with this pin. Okay, let's. What, what's that word you just you finished piece? It's not a finished piece. It's a finished sketch. What's a piece? What is a piece? It's, oh, I, yeah, I like them, but they're not the kind of thing where you get to sit down and say, all right, I'm going to sit here for an hour or two and just enjoy the meditative experience uh -huh. of this one piece where your mind can wander a lot because so much of it is what we called monkey work. You know where that core shadow goes? Now you're going to go from a hard core shadow to a softer core shadow and you're going to try to make it lovely. Those two that you showed me kind of in the, the, towards the beginning, mm -hmm. I, those are finished, to me, those are finished pieces. Okay. Well, well I know you didn't spend two hours on them, but that doesn't no. make they're not finished. I love, I love the, the looseness of it. Well, I, thank I, you. I honestly Gosh. feel, I honestly feel like, and, and this is all a matter of taste, but I feel like if you, if you spend two hours on that, those two that I, that I really mm -hmm. loved, Mm -hmm. I would not love those fin finished I ones understand. nearly as much because yeah. I love those sketches that you just showed. They would become more literal. Yeah. They would become be more, yeah, I, I understand, yeah. They'd be closer uh, to the photo. Yeah. I don't want it to be closer to the photo. <laughs> well, thank you, can Stan. I, can I buy those two sketches? Well, we'll work that do out. You we sell, gotta, do you sell? We'll have to talk about negotiations and pricings. Pri oh, well, what, what a coincidence. Yeah. Our next our next episode is about pricing. <laughs> Why don't we use those two uh, to figure out how to price your art? This can be an historical documentation <laughs> about how Marshall lost the job. Mar lost what job? How, yeah, how well, you, you didn't see, sell it? You didn't. Yeah. You didn't end up selling it. Wait, what? he wanted to buy it. Marshall Marshall overpriced it Over and, and lost the opportunity. We'll see. Are we'll you see open to having that conversation publicly or no? Yeah, yeah, I would be open to having that conversation okay, publicly. Okay, so next episode we're going to talk about. Uh, oh, wow, how that's going to be how you're going to sell. going to be dangerous. How you're going to sell those two sketches to me? All right, guys. Okay. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. See you next time when we talk about pricing your artwork. Yeah. See you then. Bye.
There is no response from the camera. Redo the Wi-Fi connection. Redo the Wi-Fi connection. Redo the Wi-Fi connection. 